Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Friday edition, the frivolous Friday edition, episode 700. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's November 12th, 2021. All right, I'm, I'm kind of tired of talking and asking you guys to like the show. So, so from now on, you're just going to see little icons pop up through the show that instruct you what to do if you like us or don't like us, or if you want to comment or not comment, or subscribe or not subscribe. I, I need to take those those verbal duties away from me and, and just leave it up to you. So I purchased a little icon pack that I can add to Final Cut uh, that should be able to help you, the viewer, know what to do now for those of the people on the podcast you're just gonna have to trust me you're just gonna have to automatically like the program when you when you're listening to it uh i don't listen to that many podcasts i don't know if you can like them or not so that what it is what it is george it's a it's an overcast cloudy morning here in florida how you doing i am fantastic wonderful mm-hmm. great to be in florida even though it's a little overcast but the weather's going to clear up the next few days, and Florida is a really nice place, Kevin. I think you've you're going to figure out why it's so great, and that uh, uh, we have no mask rules, and yeah. our COVID rate is half that of California, oh, yeah, which yeah. is mass to death. Okay. We have no income taxes. Uh, we have beautiful weather. We have clean, honest government, and we have a governor who. Uh, uh, he's really doing a great job. He he is not like other governors who are cur- currently uh, employed in other states. No, I have to agree with that. However, you say you're a no mask state. Uh, I just took whiskey and rye and bringing people up to speed. If you don't know, when Jill and I was in Wisconsin this summer, we picked up two kittens from a farm from a friend of ours. And it's now time for a whiskey and rye to start getting their shots. And uh, they are going to become non-binary soon. And in order to do that, I had to go to the local vet here in Florida. And I went in there, and these places are still mask Nazis. I had to call from my car that Whiskey and Rye are here. And she says, okay, don't come in. We'll come get you when there's a room available. And this little technician lady comes out in about five minutes, knocks on the door, takes my cats out. And, uh, sir, do you have a mask? I, I haven't worn a mask in six weeks. I don't have a mask. Here, pulls one out of her pocket and so I get to go into the uh, the vet with my mask and my cats and uh, had a wonderful appointment but some places and I guess healthcare facilities in Flor- Florida still do require a mask and I was very surprised and I, I, I felt uncomfortable and claustrophobic again for the first time wearing a mask I couldn't believe it like oh no is it coming back and then I go and read the headlines yes it's back Colorado experiencing COVID resurgence. Europe has a new uh, variant. It's not Delta. What comes after Delta is something else, I guess, you know? And it just, beta. it's, yes. <laughs> it's just like Alpha, it's, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Eta, Theta, I want to lap again. <laughs> Oh. So it would be the hate of us, Mary. <laughs> okay, frat boy. Remember, <laughs> Kevin, I took, no, I, no, not frat boy. I had to. I, I saved money on my children's private school tuition by teaching Greek all those years ago. <laughs> and so yeah, it, it's just not ending. And so I thought, hey, episode 700 will be about the never-ending story. Um, so, yeah, Florida's great. Florida is um, much better than other places we travel in the country, a lot less crazy. And, you know, Jill and I do enjoy living here for four or five months out of the year. Okay, Lots of stories. And, and it's the home of the beloved Florida man, as found in American news. Whenever a story starts yes. off Florida man, it's some screwy oddball who either is burning the Quran uh, oh, in it's, public yeah. or has decided, you know, it's shorthand for uh, local idiot. Uh, hey, I'm going to link this. I'm going to link this story. Jill and I were watching a video, and the title was Florida man. Uh, finds gun while fishing and he's out there casting and this you could tell he skipped a lot of high school to go fishing <laughs> when you see the interview and he's really in one day and he was oh 
I lost the fish and I got something bigger and I pulled in a revolver and I called the sheriff and he just he's doing this in this great Florida accent and stuff like that and Jill and I are looking at each other and yeah that's a Florida man story but I, every Florida woman's story is about some widow losing money so to corruption or scam or uh, a grandma the other day lost seven hundred thousand dollars florida women uh loses money and scam so not every florida story is a great story george oh. yeah so all right let's do some good news stories here um geez okay the finland story that is a good news story well it's bad news because somebody's being well, let's persecuted do the martin men story let's do the martin okay, men story do okay cool Oh, mom sent me some information. I didn't. Uh, let me turn my phone off. There we go. Okay. Mom is my clip in service. She finds articles all over the internet that relate to RV and she sends them to me. Thank you, mom. That's uh, that's what moms are for is to, to send you articles from magazines and newspapers and the internet all day long. And she does a wonderful job. So, yeah, do the Martin Mins um, because it's a contrast. It's a contrast story that well, we talked actually, about. Have, haven't we become the Martin Men's Clip Service? Uh, yes, we have. Well, in the last two episodes. Well, we talked about his ad clearum um, from last week where he talked about miracles. No, no, no. Isn't it? It's, it's an ad to the dead clericum. Come, come, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you we can't enjoy putting you, syllables on these words. You can't spell it, and I can't say it. So it's, oh. <laughs> it is the ad clearum. I call it the ad clericum because it's for clerics, but uh, apparently that's not right in the original Latin. So it's the ad clearum. He, t he talked about uh, miracles in relationship to um, a priest in his diocese who was severely injured with uh, spinal cord injuries and is recovering clearly via a miracle. And it, it was nice to see that in story form. Here we have another ad clarum from Martin Mintz. And it's nice to see this, and I hope he's doing this because of our prompting, uh, where the bishops are starting to speak about uh, things that are important in the daily life of the church and stuff the clergy seem to have forgotten. George, what's the story? Well, last week, I'll preface this by saying I helped people with their spelling by spelling gormless, and I sort of <laughs> sort of decided, well, I'm sort of bored spelling this word, so I'll just stop about midway through. Uh, another word we'd like to spell for you this week is ironic, uh, which I'm not going to try to spell on, in, on uh, the show. But it's wonderful when you see bishops being high-minded not about mosquito nets or politics mm -hmm. or all the sort of push button issues that uh, we see on uh, that your mother is going to send you clips about, but rather about issues that are timeless and eternal. And Martin Mintz has put out another wonderful ad clarum mm -hmm. that will stand the test of time. You can read it in 50 years and it'll still be worth reading about preaching and how it serves to basically build the kingdom. Uh, faith comes by what? Hearing, hearing what? The word of God. And we're, how do we do that? We preach it and teach it. And I just want to thank Martin for for doing his job very well as interim Bishop of Pittsburgh. Sure. Well, I mean, we as a show, have our success is what's wrong with uh, the church what's wrong with the roman catholic church the Anglican church lutheran church you name it where the church is is uh being led in error by its leaders we are famous because we talk about and, it and it, we still haven't finished the topic after 700 episodes no <laughs> it's it's <laughs> our infamy remains because of this in as such um if people were doing what martin mintz did there would be no need for a show like Anglican Unscripted to to try and hold a, a church accountable. Um, there would be no need for a laity to rise up and say, stop, you're, you're killing the church. There is no salt and light coming from the leadership in the Anglican Communion. The Roman Catholic Church is off doing something strange this week again. What did the Pope tweet from COP26? And, oh, what are the Lutherans? The Lutherans never make the news anymore, so unless they... Yeah, so you just... They made Anglican Unscript, Anglican Inc. this week. They did. Did, did they you did. see there's the, the joint Anglican-Lutheran uh, 
slash American slash Canadian statement on the 16 days of gender violence for gays, lesbian, two spirit. I, I can't even I can't even list all of the uh, yeah. but uh, they've they've rewritten the Magnificat to apply it to gender justice for marginalized sexual minorities. So Take a deep breath, we'll go on. <laughs> just like you just like I can't, you just like you know, so um who pays work, for this stuff? Who pays these people to I do this? But my my point being a working church does not need an Anglican unscripted. A broken church does. And uh, the the more times uh, the Archbishop Duncan's, the Bishop Martin Minns, the Archbishop Foley's, the, the wonderful primates around the world start uh, being leaders again and teaching well, uh, I have no reason to, to, to be here. I can just turn my little camera off and I can stop complaining about the broken church and I think the world will be better for it <laughs> in two ways. Less Kevin, well, more church. Well, let yeah. me just, just add one little final thing and no, Martin is not paying us a dime for saying this. <laughs> Martin's, Martin's ad clarums recently have been models of theological clarity. Mm -hmm. But what sets it apart from most other bishops' statements is he writes really well. He has very good style. So he has, a, he has a talent stack that allows him to succeed at this much better than uh, his peers, in my opinion. Well, hold on a second. I, I find the average Anglican has a higher degree of spelling capacity and grammar knowledge. I know this because I have neither. And so when I speak or write on Facebook or on Anglican anywhere, I get lots of corrections. And so there are lots of Martin Minns people who are very good with the, the prose, you know, and able to communicate. Kevin is not such. And I wake up every morning saying, God, why do you have me in a communication ministry? You know, it's just whatever, you know. I'll just complain about myself now, too. George, there's more stories out there. I wanted to talk, cover the Finland story because it's about Christian persecution and kind of what's left of American leadership in trying to fight against it. Uh, I was disappointed to read on Anglican.inc this week that six congressmen had to write to Finland and say, We're, we may have to withhold a, a vote on an ambassador because you decided to persecute somebody who has a biblical understanding of marriage. My disappointment is it's only six congressmen. You know, that, that, that's sad. It should have been all of our congressmen. It should have been our Senate. It should have been our president standing up and saying, no, we will not persecute those who agree or disagree with us. Um, that's not happening, George. But let's talk about the, the Finland story. 2004, a booklet was published in Finland by uh, uh, that spoke about God's plan for human sexuality and it was biblically orthodox. It discussed uh, what the Bible said about these passages, and the portions of it were written by a woman, and I'm sorry, sorry but Finnish names are impossible to pronounce. Uh, let's fast forward to 2017. Finland legalizes same-sex marriage. The editor of that book is elected bishop of the Evangelical Missionary Diocese of Finland, which is sort of the a CNA of Finland. Mm -hmm. There's the state Finnish church, and then there's the conservative breakaway church. Activists go get to the prosecutor in Helsinki and say, look, this book that was written in 2004 by this woman, where the new bishop of the ACNA type church is the publisher, says that homosexuality is bad. Therefore, they are discouraged they are engaged in hate speech and in a hate crime, and they do need to be prosecuted. And the Helsinki state prosecutor has been putting together a case to bring on trial. And this woman is now a member of parliament, and the man is a bishop. And this woman is also part of her, uh, she's accused of tweeting out a passage, I believe, from uh, uh, the Apostle Paul on what uh, keeps people from going to heaven. And that's considered hate speech. Mm -hmm. And so under the new uh, laws uh, in Finland, 
Well, this caused a bit of a ruckus in Lutheran circles, and we reported on this when it first broke out. But on Monday, I think it was, of this week, six members of Congress, led by Representative Chip Roy of Texas, wrote to the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, which is the bipartisan body that does the International Religious Freedom Reports and advises the State Department on, you know, North Korea is, st North Korea is still murdering Christians and so on. And they said, we need to do something about this persecution of Christians for upholding and teaching the unchanging truth of the gospel and the Bible. And we in the Congress of the United States, we can't really do anything about Finnish laws, but uh, Joe Biden wants to send a new ambassador to Finland and we should sit on that and block any ambassadorship to, to Finland from the United States until they explain to us why they are now persecuting Bible-believing Christians. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a good news story uh, that there are um, members of Congress, they're all Republicans, uh, most of them I think are from Texas, who are up for uh, persecuted uh, parliamentarians in Finland and a Finnish bishop. Well, persecution is nothing. You, have, you haven't heard Justin Welby or any of the bleeding hearts talk no, about this? No, not at all. Um, and <sighs> Justin Welby. <clears throat> Be nice if we didn't have to talk to him about him for one episode but we persecution has existed the entire time of christianity uh, clearly the first disciples and apostles were all martyred and it's gone through cycles you know there's been good times and bad times for christianity having the benefit of the doubt and right now uh, these gender wars are slowly taking out the benefit of the doubt of Christian teaching around the world, especially you see here in Finland, you see here in America, uh, you see it where parents are, are trying to fight uh, the school boards over what's being presented to their kids. Uh, and if a parent is wise enough to read the books and says, this is what I found in the, in the school library, they get banned from the school library. It, it's very important that the state and the world governments take control of your children and that your Christian teaching of them is in the state's mind an irresponsibility. The state has a better plan for your children than you do and in Finland it's the same thing. The, the state of Finland has a better plan for its society and it does not include Christianity especially the teachings out of Scripture. So. It used to be that uh, if you wanted to buy dirty books, you had to go to the back of the 7-Eleven uh, where they had it uh, curtained off. Now you just go to the elementary and middle school library sure. and read some of this stuff. Yeah. That, and we're not exaggerating. Uh, so what what has come out in Loudoun County and Virginia and some of these other places mm -hmm. that have really gone around the bend is the promotion of sexuality at an age when children really are not able to sort of, you know, talking about uh, sexuality and stuff to a six, seven, and eight-year-old, um, there's a six-year-old in our my Sunday in the Sunday school who wants to be a mermaid. Now, should basically she should should she now get surgery to take off her legs to have fins that she's convinced that she's really a mermaid. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that's a silly thing to say, but we're, we're in some school districts, six and seven year olds can decide what gender they are today. Why can't they be decide if they're a mermaid or a unicorn? Uh, or or it's, it displays such a lack of child psychology and child developmental. It displays a total lack of understanding of how children mature and are educated which is, and in its place is the more important ideology of the sex Nazis or the gender Nazis or the woke Nazis trying to basically corrupt innocent children. It's just so crazy. Uh, if you would have said in 1980, Kevin, you know, one day uh, transgenderism would rule the day or gender wars would rule the day, you're crazy. Um, but right now at the USA Today posted a uh, poll that said 30% of millennials identify 
as LGBTQ plus plus plus. I don't remember all the acronyms and I apologize for that, but because they keep changing, it's not my fault. You can't keep changing your identity. Oh, well, I guess you can. <laughs> Genderism. And so, uh, 30% of millennials, the, the uh, people out there who are my kids' age, identify uh, as somebody other than what they were born. And it just, it, wow. 30%. Part, that, of it, part of it is faddish. Part of it is uh, uh, the fashion. Um, the, the fashion. But, you, okay, you said part of it is fadism. Fat, and that's true. This is kind of the hula hoops of the 50s. You know, I'm cool because I'm transgendered and I'm getting the attention I'm not getting somewhere else. And we saw that early on in the late 90s in Thomaston, Connecticut, where uh, some of my, uh, my children's friends came out as transgendered and they said, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a woman in a man's body or in a ba- man in a woman's body. And I remember questioning them on that. We were at some Halloween party and they couldn't answer the questions. You know, well, what is that? What is that like? What does that mean? And it was just a fad to them. They wanted to be popular and they wanted people to pay attention to them. Now it's even more so in this uh, age of social media. How can I compete with everybody else to get attention? Uh, my, I was raised to take a picture of myself and post it on Facebook and allow people to judge my pictures. And I, I get uh, pleasure in that. I get pleasure in what other people think of how I look on camera and how I dress and wear makeup and stuff like that. Well, whatever you experienced in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s has been just duplicated a billion times over for how a child is raised in uh, 2021 in face of social media. And now we have suicide rates are going much higher because kids can't handle it. Uh, They can't handle being raised in a social media life. Kevin, you and I were so fortunate. I mean, we were raised by two parents. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, Well, not a month between the two of us, but yeah, yeah. I had to. You're not I had my brother. You're not my brother. You had a mother and father, <laughs> and for in, for our generation, acting out and smoking cigarettes, mm-hmm. uh, or or uh, in other words, the each generation's bad you know bad behavior. For my for us, it was uh, beer and cigarettes. Um, you know, another generation, it might have been you know narcotics or things like that, but the this new generation is is going down sort of the psychological deformation uh whereas mine was just purely medical deformation <laughs> of lungs and liver but we are but you know you and i were both raised by loving uh parents who basically said to you you know the world is has every opportunity for you mm-hmm uh, you can be whatever you want to be. You just have to work hard for it. Yeah. And I now mean, people are being told that uh, you'll never succeed because you're this or you're that or you have this quality. And therefore, you have to be a victim. It's just sick. It just is. Sick. I I worked my tail off. My wife worked her tail off uh, to have the success we have. Um we were told in the 80s and 90s by our parents, by our teachers, by everybody who influenced us, if you work hard, you will be able to achieve these things. I now get to my mid-50s and having achieved everything I wanted to achieve, I'm told I only achieved it because of the color of my skin and because of the uh, sexual biology of my body and, uh, and my faith and a few other, and, and being American. Those are the only reasons I was able to achieve these things and I uh, know uh, because I'm able to watch people sadly come here from other countries and achieve what I achieve. Now I agree that a person raised in the public education system in the United States of America is to gonna have a, in the last 10 years is gonna have a hard time achieving what I achieved because they're being raised as victims. I was not raised as a victim. Uh, when you are raised and educated as a victim, as a person who's oppressed, you will not achieve unless you can take somebody else down to get to what you want. Um, I was raised differently, George. Uh, I, I Kind of the Michael P. Keaton of the 80s uh, w- was my hero. And um, it, it's a, and, it's a know, different was, understanding. 
I was raised, if you will, under the mythos or the, the worldview that so much has been given to you, therefore so much is expected of yes, you. Yes, that's That, you, that uh, you have been given the gift of, of faith, the gift of family, the gift of education, the gift mm. of being able to choose what you want to do with your life. Therefore, choose rightly, not for yourself, but for the glory of God and, and for the service to your country and community. Mm -hmm. Um, when I talk to younger people today, they're looking at me like uh, these words don't even have any meaning. Um, now they we don't see, know the they don't know my vocabulary. Now we see that with this great reset going on right now. If you're paying attention, uh, influ the inflation is through the roof. We've had the greatest inflation since Jimmy Carter was president. We're now at seven percent. We have the greatest unemployment and people quitting their, their jobs. People, uh, the millennials and Gen Xers and everybody, they have jobs. They're now quitting their jobs. Uh, they're going on uh, unemployment, which I, I was talking to George about the rates. He goes, that's a lot of money you get on unemployment. Yes, you do. You can get 700 bucks a week on unemployment. And they're quitting their jobs and they're not going back to the workforce because COVID put into their brains that they don't have to work. And education has uh, re-encouraged that. You don't really have to work if you want to succeed in this world. And a lot of you guys can't succeed because you are oppressed. And the people who have succeeded are oppressing you. And if you believe you actually have to have a job to make money and to uh, succeed in this uh, country, that is oppression. You were taught by oppressors that you have to have a job. And the whole worldview, not just in this nation, but around the world has changed now. And people are not going back to work and they're quitting their jobs. And this is, I never saw this in COVID. When, when I told you what was gonna happen in COVID that nobody was gonna have to go back to work at their offices, I didn't mean that they would never have to work. Well, apparently <laughs> it means you don't have to work. So it's a great reset going on, and it's crazy, George. I can't believe you would sit at home and do nothing and collect your $700 a week unemployment. I have a number of people you would characterize socioeconomically as blue collar mm -hmm. uh, in, my in my congregation. I have a cross-section of people from very wealthy to very poor. Um, recently saw somebody back in church. He's uh, a young man who, uh, went to trade school after high school and learned how to be a welder. And he went off up to North Dakota and he was telling me he was making $50 an hour as a welder at the age of 19, working on the oil pipelines. Well, the Biden administration shut all that down. So here's a guy making 20, 21, 22. He's making over $100,000 a year as a welder, a very good trade job. And he's now come back to Florida. He's basically sitting in his parents' house. And he can't, you know, his trade, you know, working welding on these massive pipelines, the government is shutting them down. And instead they're offering him money just to stay home and play video games. It's, it's soul destroying, I think is what it is. Because here's somebody who wants to work. And around here you can work in the fields you can work in a nursing home or you can work at wendy's but if you want an industrial blue collar job you've got to learn your trade and do it and then you'll do very well financially but the way the the way the government's setting things up is it's making it's devaluing the value of labor in the sense that uh well mike rowe who it's a TV fellow who sure. has uh, yeah. show Dirty Jobs. Yeah. It really is on to a point about how our society is devaluing the nobility of manual labor, of craftsmanship, of work. Um, and I just see that. And then when that happens, it is so destructive on people's psyches and souls. No, hey, absolutely. Blue collar work um, is a foundational principle of America. Uh, not only did the Industrial Revolution happen here in America, uh, make this country great, it saved us in the time of war. We were able to instantly uh, reorganize America to put out 
Navy ships and warships and destroyers uh, when World War II and World War I were uh, happening because we had this industrial base uh, to, to pick from. And, and this young man you know, would share with me just the joy he had in welding mm -hmm. and working on these. There was a sense that he was working on something bigger than himself, that he was building, that he was doing something he loved and he was doing something that was lasting and how can you have that sort of sense of internal self-development if all you do is sit home and the government sends you a check? And where they're going for their uh, ideas now, the millennials, is, is strange. I was, for some reason, somebody sent me a TikTok link and it was all of these people who had transgender surgery and most of them were women who were made themselves into men and they had these muscle implants the little uh, plastic implants to make the you know six packs and pectoral muscles and i'm like oh what have we done to ourselves you can't fix that it just ah oh, george it, you know so i hate to be a, a depressive but never in the last 200 years has the the church been needed more a society has completely lost its way we have hyperinflation going on george you went to the deli counter what did you have to pay for a pound of roast beef 15 dollars um i don't <laughs> went last night to the grocery store yeah. and uh several things were out of stock mm -hmm. um stop uh on the way to work this morning, I stopped at McDonald's and they were out of biscuits and Diet Coke because the truck hadn't arrived. And I was talking to the the uh, manager and he said, yeah, I mean, we just cannot um, keep our, you know, one day we ran out of hamburger patties because the production, the, the supply chain is just falling apart. This is McDonald's and they mm -hmm. can't sell coca-cola products and hamburgers because they don't have them and, uh, and the costs yeah. are going up don't go to the comment section right now and say george diet coke and biscuits is not a healthy breakfast that don't that's not what we want to do here we're talking oh, no about i got the them for my wife oh, that's okay that's worse <laughs> so you know it, it's amazing to see hyperinflation but here this is Kevin well, from the roast beef. The roast beef price went up from nine ninety nine a pound yeah. to fourteen ninety nine a pound in the last yeah. month. Yeah, which is crazy. But at some point, all these uh, people who quit their jobs are going to run into this inflation. They were able to at seven hundred bucks a week collect unemployment. At some point, inflation is so horrible that you need to make up the gap, and I don't know where that is. Is it sixteen dollar uh, a pound roast beef, or is it the uh, five dollar uh, a gallon gasoline? At what point do millennials and others have to go back to work now and get off the the government dime in order to pay Brandon nomic prices? So, yeah, George, it, it's it's the economy is so crazy we have to talk about it on anglican unscripted that's how sad it is uh other things we want to talk about george anglican clergy are going into politics uh as their third career and you know there's been a little strange phenomena i've had a number of odd stories that we've run on anglican inc and i think i'm starting to see some sort of trend uh the former archbishop of southeast asia bali lapak uh has joined a political party as one of the party leaders in the state of Sarawak in Borneo, Malaysia. Uh, he's not going to be running for office, but he is going to be one of the party leaders. And that's just an unusual step for an archbishop to go into politics. And moving a little north, the current uh, provincial secretary of the church in Hong Kong, province of Hong Kong, has announced his candidacy for the Legislative Council of Hong Kong. He's been, uh, he's going to run as an independent. He has the backing of the pro Peking uh, administration. If elected, he'll be the first uh, cleric in the Legislative Council since uh, Hong Kong was handed over to the Chinese. Um, we, we're seeing uh, clergy 
as they sort of come to the end of their careers, moving on to a new career of seeking to get involved in the political world. And let me just pull this all the way back to Mark Mintz, because I don't want to single out any individual in Hong Kong or Malaysia, but rather Mark Mintz is retired, and he's the assisting bishop assistant bishop assisting bishop of pittsburgh well, interim I and think. he's interim yeah. and he's using his golden years if you will to preach and teach the good news of jesus christ his fire has not diminished in the slightest and what is it telling me about clerics roughly his age and gender who would rather put their pilot who would rather put their remaining uh, energies into local politics and stuff mm -hmm. as opposed to teaching and preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. We have the phenomena in England of uh, bishops in the House of Lords and I get a little, I've set up my computer so that any time a bishop speaks in the House of Lords I get it from Hansard which is the yeah. uh, government uh, <laughs> well it basically records all speeches in, yeah. in Parliament, Commons and Lords and whenever I've said it so that whenever a certain person speaks, I get their transcript that day or whenever it's printed. And there are 26 bishops and lords, and they really are politicians. And what some of them, when they retire, are made lords like George Carey or Richard Charters or Johnson Tamu, and they carry on doing their politics. I can think of one who wasn't made a lord, but whatever. Well, yeah, I mean, this is unkind, but I wonder what Michael Nazar Ali being overlooked. He had been a member of the House of Lords when he was Bishop of Rochester, yeah. but when he retired, the government didn't didn't do what it did for Richard Charters or Richard Harris and make him a life peer. Yeah. So I wonder what he did wrong so as to upset the government in power, not to give him the that honor. But, but it's. I, I don't think it's one thing to be exercised and ex your franchise and to support politics. It's another to trade your collar for a party political platform. And we're, I'm used to some Episcopal bishops doing that, so I guess that doesn't bother me because already that's already factored into the equation. That's already discounted. But uh, I wish it were not so. No, um, let's talk. Uh, quickly before we close out the show how long are we in here oh 38 minutes thank you guys for hanging out with us this long uh apple one of the many giant companies here in america i can count facebook apple microsoft uh, google are, are, are certainly the giants out there has decided it would heed to china's demands the ccp's demands and delete the bible app that is very popular in china from their app store allowing not just for, china but hong yeah, kong as well hong kong as well allowing for okay persecution of the christians you know if you're not gonna let me read what i want to read uh especially uh within my faith that's persecution and china's interesting because china's going through a lot of economical changes right now as well they made a big mistake by banning australian coal they're going to have a, a lot of trouble uh, heating their houses this winter. They're having a lot of trouble with power cuts because of that as well. They've made some big mistakes that have weakened them, um, but that doesn't stop them at all from trying to take out the Christian church within China, especially the underground church. And Here's a, here's a funny thing in that uh, the Communist Party has long been hostile. It's always been hostile to the Christian church and mm -hmm. other religions. Okay. And it's been hostile to capitalism, but for about a period of 20 years, it backed off. And Christianity, uh, which had been growing under persecution, really took off in the underground, underground ch house church movement. Now China is clapping down, clergy arrested, the Muslim Uyghurs are being herded into uh, re-education camps. It's mm -hmm. a terrible situation. But, you know, like the, uh, the founder of TikTok, uh, has been detained by the uh, Chinese government and has basically been told toe the party line. Um, these Chinese billionaires, mm -hmm. I think one is named uh, Jack Ma. Yeah, um, Alabama. 
he uh, all about he made me some money <laughs> but <laughs> the, the the guys who have and women who have basically led the entrepreneurial revolution in china they have either been disappeared arrested or told to conform to uh, chairman xi's <clears throat> rule so uh one of the, one thing i'm seeing in, in this area in our developments is that we're getting chinese buyers who are trying to get money out of hong kong and out of mainland china into an asset that nobody can take away from you in china uh -huh. so we're getting chinese investors coming in and that's of course driving up the prices because it used to be uh chinese would invest in real estate in china but that market's just fallen apart and it can always be taken away by the government so those who can are getting their money out of china and sticking it here in hooterville i uh, know <laughs> it, it it's one of those things you need to keep an eye on um because unhappy cold chinese this winter may cause some problems for the politics of china uh, china is not yeah. afraid to be violent uh towards their citizenships everybody remembers tiananmen square and other things but you get enough revolt um that goes into and overtakes the the built-in corruption you may see some political changes in china i don't know uh just a, a editorial note um mm -hmm. some people who are not americans and not of our generation don't know what i mean by hooterville they think it has something to do with the restaurant chain hooters it does not <laughs> does not okay <laughs> Hooterville was the mythical location of the show Green Acres, which was sort of the rustic rural hillbilly uh, setting for a television show in the early 1960s. And so whenever you say Hooterville in the United States to basically people of our generation, hmm. you're talking about rural, small town farming America. A one not, street not, not town. Not a restaurant that has a particular... Yeah. Uh, double entendre for its no, title and its it, waitress it's a one street town with a bank a post office and the grocery store yeah i mean and the episcopal church and the episcopal church it, it's hooterville and there still exist uh in large parts in the country except for the farming communities where they've kind of shut down since the 50s and 60s uh once in a while jill and i go back to jasper minnesota where the, this whole Carlson clan came from many uh, generations ago and it, it's a ghost town you know it was it used to be a nice farming town and you'd go in there every saturday and you go to your little bowling alley and you'd hang out with the guys at the poker club and you go to the the bar and the grocery store but right now it, it, i think they have i think they have a church plant <laughs> and that's about it in this town and it now they have the sunset retirement community is the only working building in town mm. Yeah, lots of changing. Um, is, we have the Albany it, item. Do you want yeah, to do that? Yeah, that's hard. I mean, we're watching Albany change in just six months to, you know. All right, let's talk about Albany. Uh, there, the, and I, I say this because every diocese has a sister diocese somewhere. Every church has a sister church somewhere that was made really popular in the 70s and 80s. We're going to have a, a, a church like us. Um, in a different country that we kind of support and, and encourage back and forth. And Albany had a sister diocese kind of relationship with, I can't pronounce it, Drome. Down and Drome. Thank Say you for Belfast. That. Say Belfast. Yeah, Bel Bel Say Belfast. Belfast. And that's ending. Why is that ending? I don't know. They, they don't tell us why it's ending. They don't want to be they don't want this relationship anymore and it they just want it to be a little press release news item with no reasons attached no regret attached it just happened well they yes the uh, diocese of down and Dromore, i picked it up from the church of ireland diocese mm -hmm. not the american episcopal diocese mm -hmm. released a statement uh, saying uh, this was decided before Albany's recent diocesan convention, but we're going to be ending our special relationship with the Diocese of Albany, which has lasted for over 20 years. Bishop Love and uh, uh, Harold Miller, the prior Bishop of Down and Dremore, uh, were very close, um, and as was Bishop Herzog and the I forget the Irish bishop at that time, where they would go back and forth to each other's conventions and mm -hmm. do exchanges. And basically, they were 
it was one of the most effective uh, relationships. And now it's been stopped. And I'm more optimistic about Albany. I believe there's hope. I believe God can use Albany as a so as a as a place for the renewal and reformation of the Episcopal Church. I mean, God is not done with the Episcopal Diocese of Albany. And we just need to pray that it is protected in this time of transition and the right person come in to help them into their next next phase of leader of, of growth. But this is a sad little thing uh, because some people will, will view this as down in, about, down in Dremore washing its hands of Albany, uh, where they've sort of made the decision, well, Albany is not recoverable and we're just going to walk away. I don't want that to be true. But no, I, I don't. don't know why. Well, in every question I ask, is this redeemable? The answer is always yes. Of course, this is redeemable. Does it look bleak now? Well, yes, it looks bleak now. <laughs> okay, but I want to refer you to question A. Is it redeemable? And yes, it's redeemable. It's hard to, to post these stories because, as I told you before, Anglican TV, the first consecration we did was Bishop Love of Albany. That's where I, you know, I got my start. I had a, a wonderful interview with uh, Bishop, uh, Bishop Duncan at the time from Pittsburgh, who kind of set the, the foundation for how I do interviews. Um, you know, we, we had this wonderful interview and it was, it was well received. And I said, well, okay, we'll do some interviews for Anglican TV over the years. And it worked really well. So in my heart of hearts, I want to see the Albany situation be redeemed. I want to see the Episcopal Church come to a, a place of redemption and repentance and, and start preaching the gospel again. That is my goal. My goal is not to uh, just have the ACNA and GAFCON take over the world. My goal is to have the whole entire church repent and return to uh, a time where they worship the living God and they encourage believers again. And, well, my goal is far off. <laughs> so far off uh george we have one more story we i don't know if we're going to talk about this week let's save it for monday it's the archbishop of sedan is urging uh traditionalists to to attend lambeth it's a big topic it really is because part of me says yes go defend the, the gospel be there as as the salt and light because there's nobody else is going to be there as the salt of light of christ somebody should be there to represent christ but if you're going to go, here's what you got to do. And that's what George and I will talk about on Tuesday. Uh, until then, guys, have a good weekend. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 700 of Anglican Monster.